Awesome. So welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. Welcome to another session of our Becoming series. Uh, this session that you are joining right now is where we come together to learn about careers in energy efficiency. Each month we meet a different leader in the sector and we hear the story of how they got started, uh, what skills are important for their role, any advice they have for anybody who wants to follow in their footsteps. If you're on the eastern side of the country and you're just finishing work or finishing class, um, feel free to stand up, get a snack, get some water, go for a stretch uh, before we get into things. And if you are out on the West Coast, thanks for finding time in your afternoon to come and join us here. It's awesome to have you here. If you um, have a good story or you have an interesting story of how you found us, I'd love to hear in the chat uh, what brought you here today. If there's anything in particular that you're hoping to find out or hoping to learn, definitely let us know and, and introduce yourself in the chat. For some housekeeping, we are recording tonight's event just as a heads up to everyone. So if you do miss anything, you'll be able to go back and review that. And we have a hard cutoff time at 545 Eastern. So um, we will be shutting things down right on time tonight. Um, and if you have any questions at all that come to you throughout the presentation, definitely feel free to put them in the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your screen or you'll be able to raise your hand during the Q&A uh, portion of the event and I can unmute you to ask your question out loud. And if you put questions into the chat, I will try to catch them, um, but just know that if you don't want your question missed, your best option is the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen. And you can also vote your favorite questions up and down so we can see you know, what people are interested in hearing more about. And to introduce our speaker, tonight we get to hear from Evelyn Bouchard, a talented architect with an interesting path that eventually brought her to designing high quality energy efficient buildings. In 2017, she founded Tandem Architecture Ecologique to create sustainable and energy efficient projects and to promote uh, architectural quality in rural areas. She also began, began teaching technical courses for Passive House Canada and was elected to the organization's board of directors. Last fall, Evelyn also began co-teaching the first year design studio at the McGill University School of Architecture. You're in good hands. So Evelyn, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thanks, Kristen. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen. I've got a little PowerPoint. Oh, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Kristen, can you just enable my sharing? Thank you. Yes, for sure. Just one second here. The uh... The joys of Zoom. It feels like yes. every time you think about it, you know, there's something else that, that pops up. Absolutely. Okay. Here we go. Let's get that into slideshow mode. Okay. Uh, so it's great to be with you here today. Thanks for joining us. Um, Kristen did a great job with my intro. I won't really dwell on it further. Um, I wear three hats essentially. Uh, day to day, I'm a practicing architect, but I also have incorporated teaching um, into my role. So I teach professional courses for Pass West Canada to people who are out in the field, you know, engineers, architects, builders. And at the other end of the spectrum, I've just started teaching the first year design studio at McGill, which was my own uh, alma mater. So it's been nice to uh, circle right back to where I started. So a few words on that. I wanted to give you a quick overview of how I've ended up here <laughs> to give you one idea of one of the paths that can lead to, to architecture. Um, so starting roughly in 1989, <laughs> doing lots of Lego, drawing maps of elaborate made up towns and buildings on big rolls of paper. Um, I was just kind of drawn to, to drawing and making things up um, and you know working creatively that eventually, I guess I, I kind of settled on the idea that I, architecture was interesting in maybe high school without really knowing what it meant, <laughs> without having ever met an architect. It just sounded like a cool thing to do. Um, and so since I'm in Quebec, we have CGEP here. I took a degree in pure and applied science at Dawson College, which is a prerequisite for architecture. Uh, for those of you who aren't in Quebec, CGEP is sort of like an intermediate step that we have here between high school and college or university. So it's like a two year pre degree program. Uh, then I did my bachelor's of architecture at McGill University, including a semester abroad in France. Um, took a year off to get a bit of work experience to figure out what it is architects do before committing to doing a master's. 
um, because in order to become a practicing architect, you need a master's degree and a certain number of mandatory uh, hours of work experience as an intern. So um, yeah, I kind of packed everything up, went to the UK, worked there for a year, traveled a lot, um, just kind of absorbed a lot of being in a very different place. I uh, came back to Canada to do my master's of architecture at McGill again. And then um, began a series of internships, first in Montreal. Uh, then I moved out west, practiced in Vancouver for a while. So I, I worked at two different design firms there, Thibodeau Architecture. And um, that's where I completed my internship hours, I took my licensing exam, and then worked for a few years at local practice architecture and design, still in Vancouver. Then I came back <laughs> across the country, rode that U-Haul back, <laughs> back where I'd come from. Um, back to my native Quebec, moved back to my small hometown and founded Tandem, um, which I think has been a really wonderful experience. It was great to um, work in a variety of different firms. And I worked in firms that had 100 employees and I worked in firms that had three and kind of did a whole spectrum of work uh, in different areas. So commercial, um, residential, even some industrial in there as well. Uh, which was which was a great opportunity to learn what I liked and what I didn't like so much. In terms of formal education, um, it's been a real privilege to come come back to that first step as I'm teaching now. Um, the beginning of architecture school was very disorienting because I was coming in with my pure and applied science degree from CJEP. And then it was just like walking into art school. We were asked to do all these like incredible, bizarre creative things like the model you see here was an exercise where we had to imagine an abstract Russian constructivist painting in three dimensions and then imagine what that would be as a space so you know <laughs> that gives you an idea um, a lot of kind of pavilions and kind of there are just so many different things you're trying to assimilate when you begin studying architecture um, there's a social aspect, there's a material aspect, you know, how do you actually build things? What does that look like? There's a structural constraints, there are creative constraints as well. Um, so you know, as an education, um, I just find it fascinating. It's so diverse. You can go from something like hyper-technical and rational to something really far out where you're like playing with plasticine all in the span of a day. Um, and in parallel to that education, travel was also really formative for me. And I know that's hard to hear in this current context, uh, but we will travel again someday. So when I was doing my undergraduate degree, I spent a semester in the French Alps, um, and that gave me a chance to explore Barcelona and the work of Gaudí, um, Denise van der Rohe Pavilion in Barcelona on the right-hand side. Uh, the Sagrada Familia and just kind of immersing myself, not always in a very directed way, but just going out and seeing the world and seeing what was exciting uh, spatially and architecturally, you know, ways of working with materials, different cultures, different ways to react to different climates, um, and making great friends along the way. You know, a lot of the friends I made at school are still very close friends today. And you know, in the span of a few months, I could go from Barcelona to Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, where we had a watercolor sketching class, um, where we would just basically have to produce a portfolio of watercolors in the span of a week. So you just kind of sketch furiously, wandering around a small town, sketching and painting. Um, and that, that whole experience of uh, the education I got at, at the School of Architecture and the travel that came with it just feels like an incredible privilege to this day. It was a really formative experience to see different cultures. Um, for, for the Star Wars fans in the crowd, the image on the right is uh, Tatooine, which is actually a place in Tunisia, not just a made up planet. And it's the original set where Star Wars was filmed, which is actually um, a modified version of a traditional dwelling, which is made by digging a big hole and then digging caves out of the perimeter of it. Fun things you learn in architecture school. <laughs> so. Um, after my formal education or interspersed with my formal education, I did a series of internships. And as I mentioned in the beginning, this is really a chance to just see the breadth of things that an architect can do. Um, even though we have a common educational background, you know, everyone has to go through a certain number of steps to become an architect. 
where you end up after that is incredibly varied. And it's been really interesting to see where my old classmates have ended up. You know, some design transit, others do like super custom homes. Um, it varies immensely. It's a very versatile uh, education. It really teaches you to think in a different way that can be applied to fields that are outside of the traditional realm of architectural practice as well. When I was going through the program, there was a mandatory 5,600 hours of work experience before you were eligible to take your licensing exam. That's now been reduced to 2,200 hours to make it slightly more manageable because they were finding a lot of people just never made it to the end and never took their exam. So it was just really great experience to try a whole bunch of different, different projects, you know, from making giant models of future cities to doing residential projects, small commercial interiors and infrastructure, you know, getting a good taste of all that it can be to be a, mean to be an architect. In terms of energy efficiency, um, so my practice is really centered on passive house. It is what I try to bring to every single project. And this is where it all started for me. Um, this is, a, for those of you who are familiar with Vancouver, this is an incredibly iconic space. So this is Robson Place designed by the great Cornelia Han Oberlander and Arthur Erickson, landscape architect and architect who are among the greats of, of Canadian design practice. And these stairs are nicknamed the stramps, which is a series of stairs that are interrupted by a ramp. So the ramp kind of weaves through the stairs and it's a wonderful outdoor public space. My passive house epiphany didn't quite happen exactly here. It happened on the underside of these fabulous stairs uh, where I took a night class because underneath this, this public plaza is a complex that belongs to UBC. And under that very wonderful and evocative outdoor space is a very dark and windowless auditorium where I spent every Wednesday night for the good chunk of a winter, which is where I took my first passive house course. Um, I was working in a small architecture firm, doing a lot of commercial work, you know, logging my internship hours, trying to get my licensing exam. And I just kind of didn't, like, I still loved architecture, but I didn't really feel like it was doing what I wanted to do in terms of being in line with my values especially doing commercial work where, you know, you're doing commercial fit outs that you know are gonna get scrapped and demolished in a few years and replaced with something else. It just wasn't very fulfilling. And so I, I looked up what continuing education was available and I found a passive house course that was taught by Dr. Guido Vimmers, who was involved in the first passive house project in Canada in 2010, uh, which was the Austrian Pavilion for the Vancouver Olympics. So he came to Canada for that project, realized Canada is actually a pretty cool place to be and stayed much, much to our benefit because he started teaching passive house courses and I and my Googling for continuing education about sustainability, uh, good fortune ended up in his classroom and took that series of night courses where I met people who are still very much involved in the passive house movement in Canada today. Um, some of whom serve on the board of directors at Passive House Canada with me. So a really formative moment uh, that just kind of emerged from a bit of career dissatisfaction at the time. I'm still loving what I did, but feeling like I could do it better, I could do things that were more in line with my values. And then came the long slog of trying to get clients to actually do that kind of project. <laughs> so uh, shortly thereafter, I changed firms to move to local practice, architecture and design, which was a firm, well, it was previously Michel Abri architect and quickly became local a few months later, which is a firm that had a, a clear commitment to sustainability. And with my newfound passive house knowledge, I was really keen to apply it, but it took several projects. I guess one of the challenges with being an architect is it's a little bit like being an artist where you have to have a patron to actually do what you want to do. You don't, you know, you can't just grab a canvas and paint or make a sculpture. You're making a whole building. So you need someone who's on board with what you want to do. And so um, finding the right fit and the right client took some time, you know, it took a few years. Pacifos was brand new on the West Coast at the time. But in the meantime, I tried to kind of apply that type of building science and that type of thinking to everything I could put my hands on. You know, we worked on the Hornby Island Fire Hall and, you know, trying to figure out things like whether getting better specs on the windows would help us and doing little energy modeling on that. 
um, and just trying to apply it to every project that came across my desk in some way, shape or form. This is the first one, sorry, my cats are rustling in the corner. This is the first project where I was really able to get to passive house levels of performance. So this is an affordable housing project that's currently in construction at Simon Fraser University. So um, affordable rental housing, it's geared at young families because there's a real lack of that in the area. And the project unfortunately is not pursuing passive house certification because um, it's an expense that the client wasn't, wasn't interested in taking on, but we nevertheless modeled it and aimed for those criteria throughout the process. And we even went through a kind of peer review process with a certifier when we were in the design phase to make sure that things were lining up and that we were going to end up with the type of high performance building that we were aspiring to on a you know pretty pretty tight budget. So um, I, have, I realized when I was putting this together there are almost no photos of me working because when I'm working I'm not taking pictures of myself. This is one of the few. Uh, this is me at eight months pregnant working on this project with my hard hat. I think at that point I probably wasn't doing too many site visits anymore. Uh, to, to job sites, but um, I just thought it was kind of fun. Uh, this is an example of some of the work I was doing at the time. So looking at all the different ways you could build walls and deal with foundation conditions and roofs and what the implications would be in terms of their thermal performance in close dialogue with the engineers, with the builder as well, to really try to find a solution that wouldn't be too kind of strange, <laughs> strange and intimidating and therefore expensive. So trying to kind of play into common construction techniques, but turn them into high performance assemblies to make a project that was gonna, gonna last a long time, perform really well, but also not break the bank because it's affordable housing. And that's what I love in this, in this job is really to go from kind of a loose idea of a space and then go right through to the, the tiniest detail to resolve how we're actually going to do that. Uh, and it's a very collaborative exercise. You know, we don't arrive at a single solution on our own. And the idea of an architect who's furiously sketching brilliant ideas you know, alone in their office is really inaccurate in the end. It's a collaborative exercise to build a building. It takes the engineers, it takes the builders. And most of the time, it's not just a single architect, it's a team, at least on a larger project like this. So <laughs> having left that, moving along, um, I left the West Coast, moved back to Quebec um, after having had the baby that was in my stomach in the previous, <laughs> previous photo, and uh, moved back to my tiny hometown and kind of crossed my fingers and hoped there'd be room for at least one architect since there were none. <laughs> And uh, we're about an hour from Montreal here. So it was a, you know, a bit of a long shot, but figured I'd start my own practice and see how that went. Um, I had the good fortune to get a great project as one as my essentially my first new build project when I founded Tandem, um, working with a wonderful builder who was building a house for his daughter and who was interested in passive house. And I'd known him since I was five years old because I grew up here. So it was like, the dream perfect project to get started on. So after a few months of kind of, you know, wondering what would happen when I came out of mat leave, uh, things, things came together. And we built this, this house out near Perth in Ontario, which is uh, all the paperwork's in, still waiting for the certification to come through, but essentially was designed to the uh, Passive House Institute's low energy building standard. So here's a nice shot of the interior showing the cellulose that's just been installed. And from there on, you know, more projects have come. I have yet to have that, you know, long awaited break. <laughs> it's always either you're too busy or not enough. Uh, there was a bit of uncertainty, a bit of a wobble when COVID started, but since then things have, have picked up and haven't really stopped. Um, also trying to diversify a little bit. So I do smaller projects on my own, many as a residential kind of single family stuff. I can handle all of the architectural scope on my own. Uh, also do a bit of consulting on larger projects, so I still uh, am occasionally involved in the SFU project. This is a screenshot of a report I did for an existing social housing project that was looking at different scenarios. So how do they improve their energy efficiency and what are the different ways they could do that? Um, and just some images of other, other projects in progress. Another part of my practice is advocacy and teaching. So these sort of emerged 
somewhat organically as I was as I was kind of setting up shop back in Quebec here, the opportunity came up to teach at Pacifest Canada, which is really important to me. Uh, I love working on projects. I really love it. But at the same time, I know that climate action requires transformative change and one person on their own can't do that. It's not one house at a time that we're going to get there. So teaching is just an opportunity for me to share my experiences and try to kind of gear people up to be part of that change. Um, so I've been teaching professional development courses with Passive Canada since 2017 across the country, now all online, of course. And at about the same time, I was elected to the board of directors at PHC as well, where I'm currently serving as vice chair. And then last summer, the opportunity came up to start teaching at McGill as well. So uh, right back into the, you know, total other end of the spectrum, like super artsy, creative, teaching people to think about design end of things, which is a lot of fun. So uh, in, the, in the end, a lot of this is about kind of striking balance, you know, staying inspired, uh, managing the technical challenges of practice, trying to do advocacy work to drum up support for passive hosts at different levels of government through my work with Passive House Canada, teaching. Um, I like to think of it as a nice tidy Venn diagram and I'm in the middle, but in reality, it looks a little more like the Jackson Pollock on the right here, where it's just kind of everything is overlapping, you know, um, my, my desk right now is an example of that. I've got you know piles of sketches and notes for my teaching. Um, it's sometimes a challenge, you know, especially right now when everyone's at home, for sure, it's, it's a juggling act for balance. But at the same time, I feel really fortunate um, to have that diversity. Architecture in a way is one of the few professions where you're a generalist. You have kind of an overview of a complete project and you're involved to some degree in almost every aspect of it or at least you're kind of working closely with the people who are, are refining the, the different details of it, which I think is fascinating. It's just every project presents an opportunity to learn something new. Um, and that's, that's fun. That, <laughs> that makes every day exciting. Uh, and so in closing, um, if you're interested in architecture, uh, I think you, know, you can kind of self-identify here. If you enjoy creative work and technical rigor, it's, it's a good fit. It's a very collaborative profession. So it's very much about teamwork and discussion and being able to work with other people. A lot of it comes from being curious and being, being okay with stretching your comfort zone. I think every project is a little bit of a stretch. I, I hope every project is a bit of a stretch because I hope there'll be opportunities for me to learn something new about some aspect of the design in every single project because that's what keeps it interesting. In terms of the nuts and bolts of how you get here, um, to become an architect, you need a master's degree in architecture. Some programs, so there are bachelor's degrees in architecture. There are also master's programs that will accept people with different backgrounds who aren't coming straight in with a bachelor's in architecture. So that varies from school to school. Uh, there are mandatory internship hours after that, where you have to accumulate uh, 2,200 hours of work. And you need to kind of have work experience in each different phase of the project. Uh, these are or should be paid internships to make this profession accessible. And after all that, there's a provincial licensing exam. So the kind of licensing is by province. The exam is the same across Canada, but you need to kind of sign up for it and be logging your internship hours with a specific province. Uh, it's not terribly difficult to migrate from one to the other once you're licensed, as I've done a number of times. I've worked through, through three different provinces. Lastly, I would say that um, our profession has a major diversity problem. We have a whole lot of older white men in our profession. And so if that's not you, <laughs> please come, come join us. I think that um, it's an important, you know, we, we play an important role we define the spaces that everyone gets to live in um, and public spaces. And I think that the more diversity we have as a profession, the better those spaces will be. So in my relatively short career, I've seen you know, a shift in the gender balance of our profession, still not enough. It's still predominantly male, but there has been some change. And I just think it's so, so important to improve the diversity of the architectural, architectural profession because we're out there coming up with the spaces that everyone else has to has to live with or live in. 
So I think having diverse perspectives and di different opinions at the table is really healthy for us as a whole. Um, oh, and last word about the energy efficiency side. Uh, so the additional qualification I have is certified passive host designer. Uh, and if you're interested in that route of things, you don't need to be an architect to take that training. Um, we, we accept all backgrounds and you can see the range of courses that are offered at passivehostcanada.com. So that's it for my presentation. If there are any questions. Awesome. <clears throat> Thank you, Evelyn, for sharing. I really like hearing about architecture because it's got that unique blend of art and like really hardcore building science, which I don't think you see in a lot of places. So it's super interesting. And uh, I also wanted to say that I really feel you with that lecture hall underneath the stairs. I think <laughs> if anyone on the call has taken any post-secondary courses, you end up in some dark windowless. Yeah, in the middle point. of a very rainy winter. <laughs> you just feel like a little like swamp creature emerging from the darkness every <laughs> Wednesday night. Yeah. I don't know what day it is, what time it is. It's just- you're It's totally worth it, but a bit of a challenge at the time. Yeah. Awesome. So if anybody has questions, I have seen some people raising their hands. So if you want to raise your hand, uh, I can unmute you and you can ask your question directly. We also have the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen. Uh, feel free to put anything in there, anything you're curious about with architecture, with uh, her specific experience, with Passive House. Um, she's here. To, she's a great resource, so definitely take advantage if you have anything in your brain. And we do have some questions that were submitted ahead of time, so we'll get started with some of those. So someone asked, they read um, your blurb describing your experience and your role, and they said that they've heard statistics that the percentage of architect designed homes is as low as 1% in Canada. What is being done at a regulatory level to raise this percentage? So for example, one of the major hurdles um, to including architects in the process is the regulated fee structure causing potential clients to kind of back away. So is anything being done to include architects uh, more closely in residential and home design? Yeah, it, it comes down to regulation. So for smaller buildings, like single family homes, or particularly single family homes, you don't actually legally have to have an architect. So you can just hire a builder directly, you can hire a technologist. Um, and that's, that's partly a cultural thing. There are other countries where any building requires an architect. Canada is not one of those. Um, I don't think that's gonna change anytime soon. <laughs> I think we add value to the process, but realistically, uh, our like the, the different architects associations for each province, their job is actually to protect the public and regulate the profession. They're not there to advocate for architects. Um, there are other organizations that do, but the reality is that we're, you know, we're probably, if, if we were to kick up a stink about single family homes, we'd be up against the Home Builders Association who are far more, you know, well-funded and resourceful than, than we are. Um, so indeed, like most, you know, a, a good chunk of professional practice is on larger buildings. Um, in my own case, people typically come to me because of the past post work. That's how they find me. That's how they've heard about me, uh, which is great because I don't have to convince them. They're already there. And there are a lot of architects, especially smaller firm, you know, kind of one person firms uh, that do single family homes, but they tend to be on the higher end where the project budget will allow for the fees. Um, obviously, I still think it's a good idea to have an architect design your home. It's the biggest investment you'll ever make. And it's nice to have one who is, you know, have someone who is who's very familiar with that, has the formal training and work experience to, to get the maximum potential out of that, that budget. Um, but it can be a hard sell. You know, we're competing with tracked home builders and a whole bunch of other people with different, different um, kind of professional qualifications. So it's just part of the, the landscape we operate in. And it's always complicated. There's always a lot of different uh, different interests at play. Yeah. Gonna, there was one other question that was submitted ahead of time that's related. And after that, I'm going to go to the question in the chat. So um, do you find it, is it challenging to sell energy efficiency to clients, um, whether it's for residential or commercial? Is it something you have to convince them on or is it something people already know about when they come to you? Is it a mix? Yeah, that's a good question. It really depends. Um, I'd say at different times in my career, it's been harder and it's getting easier and easier, which is certainly encouraging. In a way, it was sort of a strategic direction I took when I named my firm Architecture Ecologique. I kind of like drew a line in the sand to keep myself honest too, to be like, no, I'm not going to do anything that doesn't line up with this. I'm going to put it in the name of the firm. And if I can't stick to that, I'm in trouble. Uh, so in my case, people actually come to me for that, which is great. I don't have to sell it. 
Um, previously, when I worked in other firms, it, you know, yeah, it can be a challenge, but energy efficiency in a way isn't that hard to sell, particularly for any client that's going to own and operate the building because they'll see the financial benefits. Um, we've seen great uptake in affordable housing and social housing for passive house because the approach doesn't rely on anything particularly high tech that requires a lot of maintenance or that'll, you know, get outdated in terms of technology. It's really just about paying a little more for the design and construction of a building and then having it be really easy to operate and really um, inexpensive to operate in the long term. Harder sell if it's a client who just wants to build it and sell it. Um, that's probably going to be the last market we conquer as far as energy efficiency goes. But, you know, even then, as recognition of, of passive house and energy efficiency grows across the country, it becomes more of a kind of tangible thing people can ask for. Awesome. Yeah, I think that the, the connections of energy efficiency and social housing are really interesting. There's a, a lot to be said about not just the price of the house, but the cost of living there. And it, it's interesting to see how those conversations are starting to happen. Yeah, um, another another big sell we try to make it at Passive House Canada is the comfort aspect, right? It's not just about efficiency. Like, yes, we're total energy nerds and we love spreadsheets. But on the other hand, it's also just a really comfy, healthy space to be in. So that helps. Awesome. So we have a question in the chat that's a bit specific. So. Someone's wondering, would they have a chance to get into an architectural master's if they only got to the last semester of their architectural degree in another country, but they do have work experience in, as an architectural tech in Montreal? So how do you know how specific they are and, and how strict they are with requirements for that master's program? It depends a lot from school to school. Um... And I'm actually not teaching in the masters at McGill, so I, I don't know what their current status is. I don't do anything in admissions, um, but it also depends on the program. So um, the McGill masters in architecture, at least when I took it, was a shorter professional degree, whereas there are other programs like um, UBC, for example, where they'll take students with any background. So you could have no architectural background at all. You could have a degree in literature and go into your masters of architecture. Those programs do tend to be longer because they need to kind of give you the technical skills and the design training. Um, so with the background you described, I think I would just, you know, try to approach the schools you're interested in and see. Um, there are also paths for recognizing uh, degrees and work experience. They tend to be pretty long and onerous, but the other way you could look at it is essentially approach your provincial uh, association. So in Quebec, that be the Art des Architectes Québec and uh, talk to them but unfortunately those kind of like recognizing credentials from other countries and work experience tends to be quite time consuming like it's a long process to get all that experience recognized so masters might be more expedient yeah, it's definitely a i think a, a bigger problem is those questions of trying to recognize degrees across across regions across countries it's, it's a, the system's a bit of a mess right now but definitely i think you're like everything you're saying, just asking those questions and reaching out to people is, is a good way to get started. And we've got some good questions rolling in now about Passive House. So uh, mm -hmm. Andrew is asking, as someone who's interested in Passive House, but doesn't really know where to start, where's the biggest need for trained Passive House professionals? Is it more on the design side, the construction side, somewhere else? All of it, <laughs> really. We need all of it. Um, it's, it's really a change in how we think about buildings and how we build buildings. And what I love about the courses I teach at Passive House Canada is that we have mixed mixed classes. So essentially I'll have, you know, builders, <clears throat> pardon me, architects and engineers all taking the same course together, which leads to really great conversations and good exchange during the course. So um, there has been, there have been more early adopters in the design side of things, but I think generally it's still early days across the industry. So there's definitely going to be a need for trained tradespeople as well um, and experienced builders. It kind of depends where you are in the country in terms of exactly where we on, are on the adoption curve, but in general, everything is heading in that direction. So yeah, <laughs> the Passos training should serve you well, regardless of which sector you're in specifically. Yeah, if you're looking for a career with growth potential, energy efficiency related work, passive house, it's, you're on the right track for sure. Um, yeah. Awesome. And then so a couple questions about other certifications. So how do passive house principles compare with lead principles? Do you know much about the crossover, the differences? 
Yeah, PASFOS is more narrow in scope. So it's really focused on energy efficiency with a bit around air quality and comfort as well. And it's it in that narrow scope, it's extremely demanding. So it's kind of the most ambitious energy efficiency standard for buildings in the world. Is more kind of broad, but not as deep dive. Um, how they're structured is different. So passive house is essentially kind of gives you an energy budget for the building and, and gives you an energy modeling tools and, and gives you complete freedom in terms of how you get there. You just have to kind of prove it out. Um, LEED is more prescriptive in its approach. So it's more of a kind of checklist of requirements and you go through and you kind of tally up your points looking at all those requirements. So they're kind of structured fundamentally differently. I think that the best possible building would do both. Um, in, in my own experience, I've kind of chosen passive house because I like that it's kind of more, more technical. Um, I like that it gives me creative freedom. And I feel like the stuff I do in energy modeling through passive house kind of makes the invisible parts of the project visible. I can make more well-informed decisions when I'm optimizing my design. I, I guess I get more valuable feedback that I can incorporate into my design decisions. Um, which like it's just more tangible than looking at broader criteria like i guess i can feel i feel like i can you know i can put bike racks in and spec water efficient features relatively easily whereas figuring out the nuts and bolts of the impacts of different decisions on energy efficiency is a little more complex so that's why why i guess i find passive house more compelling personally Awesome. Yeah, and there's another related question here from Stephen. So are there any other green or energy efficient building standards that you find interesting or that intrigue you? Um, oh, there's certainly bucket loads of them out there, <laughs> for sure. Uh, at the end of the day, there's kind of only so much bandwidth you have. So I'm always like, I'm always interested in materials. Uh, I think embodied carbon is a major major concern that we should be thinking more deeply about. So that's something that I've been looking into more. Um, but to, to be completely honest, you know, other than doing the obvious stuff of trying to use materials that come from, from renewable sources that are local, uh, the water efficiency piece, um, there's only so much time you have to do the deep dive and keep up the certifications. So I found that Passive House is the one that serves me best. Yeah, there are definitely a lot out there. Like, it, 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 it's tough even as someone working in the energy efficiency sector to always keep track of, you know, which certification relates to which areas. And, and I think the important thing to know, like you said, is they all have different focuses and different goals. So just being aware of those can help you figure out which one you enjoy. Um, and we have another one of our pre-submitted questions. So just so everyone knows, we've got about uh, eight minutes left. So if you do have other questions, um, feel free to drop them in the Q&A. So we do see another one here. Um, so Zach is asking, what are some areas of the homes that rank high in terms of energy efficiency gain versus cost? So I think Zach, you're asking about um, really cost-effective energy efficiency measures, but uh, if I'm wrong, definitely let me know and, and add some details to that question. Yeah, and just a clarification before I dive into that, um, despite its name, the passive house standard can be applied to any building type, so it's not just for homes, common misconception because it's got a poorly translated German name. Um, so in terms of return on investment, I mean, there is kind of the performance targets passive house sets out are trying to find that sweet spot where you have conserved enough energy through your building envelope, so through your air tightness and insulation, your you know, good quality triple pane windows, that your mechanical system, so how you're actually doing the heating of the house can get a lot simpler and a lot cheaper. So you're trying to recoup some savings there. Um, air tightness is probably the most like underrated, underappreciated energy efficiency measure. It's very poorly understood in the construction industry as well. Uh, it costs almost nothing in materials, but it does require really good detailing in terms of the design and having thought through continuity of the air barrier and really good craftsmanship and execution. So I'd say that's probably my like least, least appreciated, most important element that impacts efficiency. Awesome. Yeah, energy efficiency isn't always glamorous, but it's always great. <laughs> Um, and another question here from Andrew, have you ever worked on a project that included renewable energy production, such as built-in solar PV? Um, I've, I've come close. <laughs> I've always wanted to, but unfortunately, inevitably something's got to go on the budget. Like you always come in, you know, 
most of the time there is the the euphemistically named value engineering phase where stuff needs to get cut out and unfortunately uh, the renewables are most often on the chopping block in terms of strategies i think trying to reduce your consumption as much as pos possible the first step is always the sound idea because you know you're you're putting up a building the shell of that building should last like 100 years hopefully hopefully more um, and so any inefficiency you put into that building shell, you're going to be stuck with for a long time. So I'd rather put that money into making a really efficient building that'll consume less. And then if there's money left, we do the renewables, then compromising the quality of the building envelope and putting the renewables in. I think it just makes sense to not use the energy first and then generate renewably with, you know, whatever is left. Unfortunately, there's not always much left. It's the nature of almost all construction projects. Awesome. Thanks, Evelyn. And so a question more on the career side. What is a hard or a soft skill that people don't often think of that you think is really important to succeed as an architect? Um, I think I'd come back to that kind of curiosity and, and being, being comfortable, being out of your comfort zone and, and being willing to stretch um, because it's, it's a career path where um, if if you want to succeed, you need to keep exploring and you need to keep pushing yourself. I mean, we have regulatory requirements to do X number of continuing education hours every two years. Um, but beyond that, I think that you need to see every project as a learning opportunity and kind of, even if it's, you know, a, a project and you're starting out and it's not hugely glamorous and you're just doing it to pay the rent, like think about what, what's, what's the thing you can take away from that? What are you going to learn in that project and keep pushing yourself? Because a lot of it comes from self-reflection and trying to kind of have that drive to keep improving throughout. Awesome. And another, so a question about those 2,200 hours of work. When it comes to like real, real world scenario, you're trying to find the internships, you're trying to work on all the different stages of the project. How long does it tend to take to get those 2,200 hours of work? Yeah, I can speak to my experience, but um, it was 5,600 hours when I did it. So it's actually been reduced since. Uh, the 5,600 hours at the time, uh, the shortest time you could take to do it was about three years, which is what I did because I basically volunteered myself for every job site visit there was. The, the, the time on the construction site is usually the hardest to get because you need a certain amount of experience before they trust you to go out on the job site. Um, and so I did that by doing a whole lot of government fit out projects and like taking float planes to places. <laughs> you, you do what you got to do. And it was actually pretty fun. Um, so with the 2200 hours, I'm not exactly sure how that works out. Like it's definitely typically going to take longer than just that number of hours divided by the 40 hour work week, just because you've got to get those hours of experience. I also find that you're more likely to see all aspects of a project in smaller firm than a big one. Most big firms are a little bit like an assembly line. You know, you have the design team and then you have the people who take over the project during construction. They, you know, there's some communication between the two, but you tend to kind of end up in a place and keep doing the same thing over and over, at least in the larger firms where I worked. Um, whereas in a small firm, it's kind of all hands on deck. You do a bit of everything. So in a way that makes it easier to get those internship hours. Awesome, yeah, that makes total sense. Um... So we're just coming on 545 here. So I am going to just wrap things up. I want to say a huge thank you to Evelyn for sharing your knowledge, for talking about Passive House and your own journey. It's been, I think, really interesting for everyone here to learn what the path to an, being an architect, an architect can look like, because I know everyone's story is a little bit different. So it's always great to hear how it's, how it's worked for someone, especially someone who's achieved some really impressive things. So thank you for that. And uh, I want to let everyone know that we have a bonus session next week. So if you're interested in nonprofit work, we're going to be speaking to the executive director of Relay Education, Wesley Normington, about how to become the director of a nonprofit. So really interesting uh, conversation there. Same time, same place next week. And um, otherwise, just a huge thank you to everyone for coming. And Evelyn, I'll, I'll let you say any last words you want to say before we say goodnight to everyone. Thank you. I really appreciate it appreciate the opportunity. Um, I hope it was helpful to you all. And I hope to cross you in the profession someday if you do decide to go down this path or some other efficiency inspired route. So thanks very much for the opportunity. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. I'll be shutting this down. But if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to either me or Evelyn, and we'll try and help you out. Have a good night, everyone.